Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We record the show every week as we are doing today, and it is then posted to our website in our archive for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you the end of today's show where you can access all of those shows. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in um, any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, um, similar, to, similar to your state library. So we provide services to all types of libraries in Nebraska, and you'll find topics on our show for all types of libraries. Um, so K-12, um, public, academic, corrections, museums, archives, anything and everything. Really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Um, we do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, um, anything and everything. Uh, we sometimes bring in guest speakers on the show um, from all across the country, uh, from in Nebraska and all across the country, um, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do sessions for us. And um, that's what we have today um, with us this morning is Amanda Sweet. Good morning, Amanda. Good morning. And she is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, she comes on us on the show regularly once a month on the last Wednesday of the month for her pretty sweet tech session. But uh, right now, as, as you can tell, it's not the last Wednesday of the month, but that's okay. <laughs> she can be here now too. Um, she's doing a series on teaching uh, technology in the library. And this is part two of the series, um, How Do People Learn? Part one was done two weeks ago, and the recording is up on our website of that. Uh, so if you want to go and watch that, you can. Um, and then we'll have two and three and four coming up next month on July 14th and July 28th. Uh, but let's get into today's show about how do people learn? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. First, if you are new to this series, we'll kind of go over what the Teaching Tech course is all about, kind of how it got started, and how you can get started with starting to use some of the materials and start to just bounce around some ideas. And then we will talk about, this is the meat of it, which is just a primer on instructional design if you happen to be new to it. If you're already familiar with education principles and instructional design, you might learn a few of the new things that have come out and how it pairs together with UX design mm -hmm. so that it looks pretty. If you go to the website right now for teaching tech, it does not look pretty. The whole purpose of that. Yeah. <laughs> so part of, uh, part of the purpose of this series is to show the evolution of design. So this is like the teaching tech series is going to go over more a more realistic view of what putting together these materials actually looks like because in practice there's a lot of time constraints and there's a lot of solo librarians and people that are working in really small teams so there's also different design techniques and different things that you can do to progress your design over time instead of putting all the time up front to make it look perfect and then put it out there because that can take a minute and people need the information now. So we'll go over, I have a comparison of what it looked like before versus like a little upstage of what the next phase of design can look like. And then as we go through the series, it'll start looking less clunky. And that's on purpose. <laughs> and Probably the main reason a lot of you are here is to learn the techniques of how people actually learn new skills and how that actually relates to the library. So I'll go over kind of digging into the comparison of where people are when they use the skills versus where people are when they learn the skills and how you can provide better resources so that people can take what you learned and use it where they need it. 
because that is probably one of the major issues that people have with classroom-based learning and learning in the library is that they don't feel it's applicable to their real lives. So this is with the section about understanding where people are, when they're going to be using it, and how they're practically going to be using this information out in the wild. And then I'll go over some different methods that people have used for learning stuff in the library and how that can translate over. And then some different teaching tools that you can use to convert this stuff to in-person online formats and hybrid formats. Hybrid formats are um, kind of a an option where you can do all in-person or all virtual, or you can do half the classes going in-person, half the classes virtual. That's really popular right now just because COVID is still a thing, it's gonna be a thing. And there's also, hybrid has also been becoming pop, like popular before COVID even started, just because people don't always have the time to commute to the library or commute to a facility to learn stuff. It's easier to do it in their own living room. And so online learning has become increasingly popular. And, the but some people still- The of it is also very, I've heard a lot about that now, especially people are realizing making it, making all this training more accessible to so many more people. Yeah. Yeah, it's and, just, yeah, I love it. <laughs> Right? Yeah. And with limited staff in the library, online might be your only option because you just can't reach everyone, especially people who are, who are homebound or people who have really extremely busy schedules. They're taking care of their kids. They're trying to figure out work. They're trying to, they might even be trying to upskill for a new job. Mm -hmm. And they just don't have the time all the time to go in and physically sit there and then take the time to commute, go back and process the information wherever they may be. So that's why hybrid and online formats are just becoming more popular. And they've discovered that the people who are able to learn how to learn and how to harness these skills and learn this process for themselves, they're thriving more than the people who have to, um, I guess, be handheld. I don't know if that's the best term for it, but it's kind of learning how to learn is a skill. Guided. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually what we'll talk about as one of our first things is giving the, those types of learning how to learn resources to both yourself and patrons. But first, these are the six steps that I've broken teaching technology into. Right now, we're on the third step of how do people learn, how do people learn, and we've already gone over in a previous webinar the who is learning and why. This uses UX research methods to be able to dig into the different target audiences you're trying to reach and trying to look at them as a whole person, because a lot of times people try to build out a spreadsheet or they build out just this disconnected little list of who's actually what people need. But when you build out the whole person and say, this is the actual daily life people are living in, this is what people are facing, this is how they feel when they're doing it, empathize with people, then there are some different techniques for how to do that. And I put together about maybe eight different techniques that you can use. I know you probably won't use all of them. No one has that kind of time. But the purpose of that is basically personalized learning. You can grab what works for you, and they're all different techniques that do the same thing, but in different ways. And you can contextualize them based on your community, what you like, and what works for people. It's, and there's I did no this. one. Per, well, there's no one perfect way. Only the only no one way to do it. It's going to vary from person to person. It's good. It's great to have those options. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And that's because I think that's also another thing that makes people give up on learning stuff is because they're given one option, there's one path to do it, and mm -hmm. they're like, I can't, like, this doesn't work for me. What else do you have? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, that's what we've got. And then they're like, well, I guess I'm just not learning that thing. And <laughs> they walk away. Mm -hmm. And so then the what's the problem is that once you understand what people are facing on a day-to-day -day basis, you start prioritizing what is the most important thing that they're facing right now, 
what are they going to try to tackle immediately? Because if you try to help people solve problems that are about 10th or 11th down on their list, they're not going to take action to do it. They're not going to come into the library or use resources to solve something that doesn't really matter. And people don't always know how to articulate the problems that matter to them. Um, you don't like they don't always know how to set goals or how to break problems down into steps. And if you put out a survey that says, "Do you want to use, learn Excel? Do you want to learn Facebook? Do you want to learn whatever?" That's they don't know. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Like they're either just gonna say, I don't know what that is, why should I care about that? And or they will just say, Yeah, sure, show me about Facebook, go to town. But then you don't know why. And you don't know if they're trying to use it for a small business, you don't know if they're trying to use it to connect their kids. Mm -hmm. And so that digs into the why. And I think us as librarians, we have this skill to dig into what people really want using that reference interview that we've all learned about and, and use daily. We know from experience, they're not going to really ask us what they really need. And we have to figure it out. And that's exactly what we have the training for. Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of like, and there are also, you can start building out your toolbox to go to include that reference interview and then go into other UX research methods to just expand the way that you do that and just mm -hmm. kind of play off what you already do or add some new stuff to get into that. Because there's also, you've probably heard design thinking bounced around. It's kind of that term that's everywhere right now, but it's basically problem solving. It's when you under, deeply understand what people are facing, you're able to define that problem and break it down into manageable, manageable steps. So the, my favorite example and one that probably comes up most often is job searches. A lot of libraries are already helping people with job searching and figuring out what their career options are, connecting over to people to help with resume and cover letter, maybe hosting workshops and so let's break this down into the actual steps. So if this is actually the course as it looks right now. Um, but if you go into this break it down section, this actually breaks down into sections, probably more sections than you would have actually wanted for like the what people are facing when they are trying to figure out what they want to do. And the problem is that Everyone who approaches the library, they either might be at the very start of this process or they might be somewhere in the middle. And you have to find out where people are. You have to understand this process them, yourself and then understand where people are in this process, what they've completed already, if they know they even that some of this even exists. And once they find out that this process exists, then they can find out do I need this? And then when they find out, do I need this? Then you can connect them over to the resources that will help them solve it. So that was what the breaking down the problem was. But now this how do people learn is what is the best way to actually help people practice and learn these skills? So sure, you know what people are facing and you can, the easiest thing that you can do as a librarian is to send them over a link with the resource. That's kind of step one, but then it's up to the learner to be able to understand and navigate that resource and contextualize it. But the problem that library staff are facing now is they could have Googled that. They could have Googled that and said um, career exploration or Googled um, where can I go to build new skills or top 10 most popular skills. They can do that already. So what you want don't to be realize it, right? Yeah. Or don't have the confidence. So yeah. yeah. And what you want to do is be able to understand the what motivates that person, what's driving that person to do what they do, and kind of helping them work through the process of not just searching and applying for jobs, but applying for a job that's going to make them a better life. 
or applying for a job that is going to like easing that process and connecting them with the tools and resources that's going to make them a better candidate and connecting them over to understand that full process when before they would have just said, I'm putting together a resume and cover letter, putting it out into the world and see what I get. And if you just send them over a link for a resume and cover letter, that's what they're already doing. So that is your first step as library staff is to break down each different problem that you've uncovered during the user experience research part of it into these tiny little steps. And then find out, is this something that the library is going to help with or is this something that a partner organization is going to help with? Do we have the skills, resources, time to be able to do this ourselves? Is there another person in the community that's going to be able to do it better? Can we bring in volunteers that are going to be able to host workshops for this? And if we host a workshop for this, is this a problem that enough people in the community are facing that it makes it worth doing? And because I can't count the number of stories I've heard about people saying, yeah, we hosted a workshop for that, no one showed up. And is it because people didn't have time? Did you host it at the wrong time? Was it at five o'clock or six o'clock in the evening and people were just getting out of work and cooking dinner? Was it at, was this during a time when it wasn't really hiring season in your community? Was this a time that it was competing with another job fair that was in the community? Like did a local community college have a job fair that was on the day before and then just no one showed up to yours? So it's kind of, there are a variety of different things that happen with being able to plan this sort of stuff. But in terms of once you've actually try started to break this down, then you can start jumping into what are you going to do about it? Um, there are some different methods for actually breaking these problems into the steps. And if you haven't seen this already, this is a little cluster of resources that you can use to connect people to the actual tools. So this is categorized out by topic and you can just click it over to open out the different resource. So once you have the resource available, then you wanna start thinking about what is the framework in which I'm going to connect people with this resource? Are there enough people that it's great for a group training? And if you do a group training, is are all the people within that training, do they have a similar skill level? Because if you have really advanced level people and intermediate people and lower and beginner people, then, and you try to give them all the same content, you're gonna lose the advanced level people and they're just gonna zone out. And then the people that are beginners are gonna be really confused because you're usually trying to get to the intermediate level people because you kind of naturally fall to the middle of the road. And so if you already know that everyone in your community is at a different level and you're not providing different resources or pairing together advanced level people with beginner or intermediate level people, then it's kind of already lost. And it's also really common. I did that when I did the teaching technology workshops. Mm -hmm. That just kind of happened. And they didn't go as well as they could have just because how in the world would you already know what people's skill levels are when people are signing up using an online form? I can't do my UX research because I can't, I don't know who signed up until I just get the list two days before the thing. So you have to go from middle of the road. Mm -hmm. And that's why the online workshops they're kind of hit or miss they're great for letting people know the process exists and you're there for under like understanding what's included in the resources that are made available so that they can understand what is most relevant to them that's what happens in webinars i'm doing it right now i don't know what your skill level is <laughs> Right. And the only way to do that is to be really, really specific beforehand in that you are doing something that is for a certain level. And yeah. then you have multiple courses or webinars for beginner, intermediate, advanced people. Yeah. And you have to do multiple sessions, which is okay to have that as be your process as well. But if you don't have the time 
or the ability to do that, you need to figure what's the middle. Hopefully I won't lose too much the two end extremes. And if those people do need more, they inc they will reach out to you and ask for the, what they need more. And then you can continue with a little more one-on-one -on -one afterwards, maybe. Yeah. And that's pretty much more or less what happens. But it's also, there's another element to this because this is placing all of the emphasis on the trainer, on the librarian. Mm. But right now there's a shift over to say, well, what's the role of the learner? What are they doing? And do they know how to leverage and practice the skills that they learned in a webinar or leverage and learn the skills that was that they learned in a conference or something? because you learn all this stuff and then you might only be interested in about 5% of it. Well, how do you make those little practice activities to start learning that? And that's, so that's where we'll dig into learning how to learn. So if you, the best way is to just start with these books. If you are a beginner to learning how to learn the concept, um, Barbara Oakley, she also teaches a Coursera course that is learning how to learn. It's basically like a little four week primer that tells you the basics of what you need to know. You can audit it for free or you can get a certificate. And this was, it was an awesome course. She also, I've read every book that she's got. She's awesome. And she has like some TED Talks that are out there. So if you start following her, she's awesome. Um, Barbara Oakley, she also partnered with Scott H. Young. Um, Scott H. Young wrote Ultra Learning. It's basically how to learn skills quickly, eff efficiently, and effectively. And so if you are trying to explore what you actually want, what you're doing in life, what you want to start upskilling with, then the, he has like a little framework that'll show how to do that. Um, he's also got a blog that will go over some different articles, keep you updated and as he learns, he'll teach you. And he's also got a, he, I've never done this one, but he's got a master class for learning how to learn. And so Scott H. Young also partnered with Cal Newport. And Cal Newport is the one who he's working with for his master class. And Cal Newport talks about deep work. So it's basically changing your habits so you can actually make the time, remove distractions, and learn the stuff that you need to learn to be able to do anything. He focuses it on learning because he is a professor and that's kind of his thing. But so these kind of pair together to be able to start building the trifecta of learning how to learn. And so this Atomic Habits also digs deeper into um, identifying what you actually need to change to be able to do things, to be able to make time for things, um, get better at being you, all that stuff. And it'll go through the incremental change instead of just going whole hog, cold turkey, doing the horrible bad diets, which I've done 40 of them. And so it'll, it lets you, it guides change better. And there's also, so design thinking, it's usually for problem solving, but you can also apply it to your life. So this is the design thinking life playbook. So a lot of times at heart, any sort of digital and technology skill people are trying to learn, it's going to revolve around what they want out of life. It's going to revolve around what they actually want to do and be. What matters to them? Are they trying to help their kids have a better life than they did? Are they trying to, what are they trying to do? So before people are going to be able to articulate the digital and technology skills they want to learn, they need to know the direction of their life. Um, people will have a winding road to actually living life. So if you connect them over to a way to design their life and a way to measure their life, Clayton Christensen is, unfortunately, he recently passed away, but 
he was a professor who talked about innovation design and he talks about what makes a good life and he talks about like this is the heart of ux design is who are you what is your life and so that's pretty much what he talks about and you're not going to be able to know what you actually want to learn until you know what matters in your life mm -hmm. and a lot of times people will say one thing matters but they are just saying it because they're supposed to they won't actually take action for it because it was just what their friends were saying and it doesn't actually matter to them um, if you want to learn more specifically about instructional design um, I put in the finding your element from Ken Robinson just because it was delightful and he talks about how to get a job that doesn't make you want to bang your forehead against a wall and mm -hmm. kind of ex the way different ways to explore and kind of find that thing that rings true for you and this is a link over to Scott's blog this is the learning how to learn course um, this is everything that you need to know about instructional design the topics tools resources so if you go between these two different ones um, you'll get the basics um, you can all if you really really want to you can also take the class there's some on edX and Coursera if you want a certificate but these are really really good and I'll mention since you are um, talking about those links in there um, because someone did ask too and I'll let everyone else know um, but yes the slides um, will be available afterwards we always have a link to Amanda's slides and any handouts um, the link to the um, teaching technology course is in the session description so you already have that for what she, what she was talking about but when we do when I post up the archive which will have the link to the YouTube recording there'll be a link to the Google slides that Amanda has here so I skipped past a slide about resources to learn UX. You can click through them if you're interested. Um, you'll get that link over. But this is kind of the meat of how of learning how to learn. This is kind of what I frame the learning how to learn section around, which is what are the phases that you would use to actually learn new skills. And so Noel Birch, he did, he worked in human resources. He did a lot of training and design. So these are the basic stages, which is unconscious incompetence. You don't know it exists. You don't know why it matters to you. Um, these are the people that might not have a smartphone yet. These are the people that um, they don't want to learn how to use a computer because they don't see their relevance. And they have no idea why it would be relevant to their lives. Then the conscious incompetence is, okay, I just found out that a smartphone is gonna help me in an emergency when I'm driving across country when I go visit Florida for the winter. And so I'm gonna learn how to do it, but I'm only gonna learn how to make phone calls, call 911 and do the basics on it. And then you're going to start then you need kind of a list of the basic skills that you need to accomplish your goal. So conscious incompetence, they set their goal, they know why it matters. And then you shift over to conscious competence where you start practicing it, but you still need to check all the tutorials to get it right. So you need to try really, really hard to be able to do it. You're actively learning. Then unconscious competence, you can pull it, you can whip out your smartphone and you don't have to think about which button or to press to be able to make a phone call. It's natural, it's, you can do it in your sleep. So this is what people are working through no matter what skill they're trying to do. And people are trying to work towards a different level of competence based on what they actually want to do. Um, a lot of times the level of competence is going to be based on the amount of times you're actually going to practically use it in your real life. You might learn how to use Zoom or how to use um, a smartphone more in depth than you would when then you would learn how to make a resume and cover letter. Because ideally you would only learn how to make a resume and cover letter once in a blue moon. Um, if you're a job hopper, I guess maybe you would learn it every year or so. But even so, it's a, it's more or less just once in a blue moon. And so and then there are also things like 
um, parents that are trying to connect their kids with safe technology tools. They want to learn how to use the process and the frame of thinking so that they can evaluate new resources as they get them. And they also want to be able to get that list of curated resources of what's safe. So you might send them over to Common Sense Media to learn their playbook and guidebook. And those parents will be more invested in learning that full process and being able to practice that skill through to competence so that every time they encounter a new resource, they're able to evaluate it just in the blink of an eye and say, this is safe, this isn't. So that's how you would start to evaluate how well people need to build that competency level. And there's also, as I started observing and kind of working with libraries that are starting to use these materials, I also started to notice that the types of activities that you use change as people move through this competency stage. So as you're going through the unconscious incompetence and you have no idea what you're doing, you have no idea why it matters, this is when you are in the introductory stage. This is when you can be more generic. This is when like a technology petting zoo would come in handy or when an introductory workshop for all beginners would come in handy. This is why the WordPress workshops go over really well, because when I space them out and do them maybe once or once a year or every other year, WordPress has changed enough that everyone's a beginner again. And you can start learning all that stuff and then you have to go through and start practicing the skills all over again, because WordPress changed their editor and it just looks completely different and people have to start practicing it and gain that competency again. And they wanna know what's possible with a new editor. So even if you've been using WordPress for several years, you are starting the cycle somewhat in the middle again. And just understanding where people are in that staging, really helpful. And so let's look at this for the example that I use in the course is people working through the process of learning Zoom. So this is probably one of the most common things that people are doing right now. Uh, let me. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Amanda. You're good. Yeah. All right. So let me open this up here. So this is the example that you'd want to, I put together the primer of examples for instructional design, just in case you don't want to read that mess of stuff. And this is just kind of like the cliff notes of the stuff that's most important for teaching tech. And, but where we are going is this example for learning Zoom. So this is kind of an example of how people would actually approach the library and start working through this process. So the most common example is um, a man who wants to start video chatting with his daughter who lives out of state. He's not able to connect with her as often as he likes and the phone is just not the same. So he wants to start learning Zoom. He's homebound, so he's not gonna be able to actually go into the library to learn this stuff. So he just kind of reaches out over the phone or via email that says, what is this Zoom thing that everyone's talking about and will it actually help me with what I need? So this is actually a really specific question that most people don't ask. Most people just say, what is Zoom? Or I wanna talk to my daughter online. And that is kind of the approach that people come to the library with. So the way that the library can help you help him walk through this process is to say, just to have him hop onto the phone or do like a screen share and say, this is what Zoom looks like. This is what you're gonna be able to do with it. This is your introductory lesson to it. And then start talking to the patron, working through it and start setting goals. 
we already know from the beginning that one of his goals is to be able to start a Zoom session and be able to talk to his daughter online. So we know he wants to know the basics of Zoom. So as the library staff, you would start breaking Zoom down into a problem. You would say these are the different elements that he needs to be able to learn and then start breaking it down into basically a checklist. So if you say, here's the checklist of what you need and this is how you're going to be using it. She knows that he's going to be using Zoom at home at his, at his office computer and he's going to be learning it as he uses it. So he's going to need a set of infographics and cheat sheets that he's going to be able to reference so he can find tutorials quickly. So if the librarian starts to format these and build in cheat sheet tutorials and quick link tutorials, then that is going to be what's more valuable to him than just a resource that says, here's Zoom, go to town. Because he's gonna be able to directly relate Zoom over to what he actually needs and you've helped him break down the process to zero in on exactly what he wants. Because when you send over a link that says, here's Zoom, go to town, then he has to do the extra work. And he has to start working through that process of eliminating the information that isn't necessary and only pulling in the information that is. That's going to take more time for him to actually learn it because we're librarians. We know that research takes the longest part. Like that is, that's the hardest part in doing it all. And that's what throws most people off of learning is that they don't have time to do it. That's why they asked you. And so that is kind of your deliverable that says, this is what that will actually look like. And this is what you're going for. This will directly help you. This is the cheat sheet infographic that you can keep pinned up next to your desk that you can reference it. And until he reaches that unconscious competence stage, and he doesn't need any of this stuff anymore, this is what, that's the resources that will help him get to that. And so this is basically what you're doing in every single problem that is ever faced. And if you open up this, I'm gonna open up this digital. Oh, I had it open here. So these digital skill categories are some of the most common problems that people have faced in varieties of different ways. And, but let me open, there's one more. I'll open my Canva because it's in there. There we go. This is the same thing formatted differently. So these topics are this. So this is kind of that design thing mm -hmm. is it starts out as this. This is your planning document. And this is basically just generic topics bulleted out in a list. And then it's kind of separated out into different subcategories within that topic. And then there are different resources that dig into that. But this gets converted into this. So it's easier to process. The topic is still there. You're directly telling people this is how the library can be of service. And you can I mean, basically insert logo here. Just say who you are, what you're doing. And eventually this would get clicked over to a clickable link. So this you would just click open into what it is or you can keep this as a PDF or a reference document so that you as the library staff can use this as a tool to hand over to a patron and say, point to the thing that you need most and start prioritizing what is most important to you. Um, in UX research, they would use, they would call that something like card sorting. So card sorting puts out a set of topics and then you would start to organize those topics based on priority. You can't start organizing topics until you have something to work from to start helping people brainstorm what actually matters. 
um, what matters to them might not be something that's on this list and they will tell you and but they just having this as a reference point so that you can point to it and say this is the problem I'm facing what do you got for me and then you start contextualizing it to the person's actual life actual life helping them articulate specific goals within that category start breaking it down into many steps find out what the library can help with what partner organizations can help with and then build out like a full service solution to the problem that they're facing. And so I will share this out. Um, I know it's also, it's also in the course, but sometimes it's just easier to have it here and to view it. And this will be in the chat. <clears throat> While I'm copying and pasting this, if anyone has any uh, questions about this so far, feel free to ask. Yeah, yeah, type into the questions section and your go to webinar interface and we'll grab that. Um, and I'll just, you know, do a plug too. We, I love Canva. Canva, if you haven't used it, you know, make things very pretty very easily. Canva is awesome with that. <laughs> And so let me hop back in here. So if you want to read more in detail about that and basically kind of the thought process between what that would look like for library staff, then the example is there. But the big thing is, how does this actually translate to a library service? What does this look like in the actual library? So you can, you can read this at any point. This is just kind of a list of points where this actually informs the design of a library service and kind of figuring out the different resources, tools. Um, honestly, it's going to be a lot better if you just sift through it and find out what's most important to you. But just for the sake of time, we'll skip over to teaching tools and methods. So there's going to be two sides to this right now. These method, methods of instruction are the most common ways that libraries are already using or are starting to use more commonly to be able to connect people with the tools and resources they need to be able to do the things they want to do. So these are this is what I call the methods of instruction. But then within these methods, there are different tools. So, and I'll open this here. So this is still fugly. I haven't made it pretty yet. It just, <laughs> so these online teaching tools are digital tools that you can use to make things look better. And I'm going to silence my phone. I don't know if you heard it. No, I didn't hear it. <laughs> oh, then it was never there. <laughs> so this is just basically by category. So this is by common activity option that you would do in the library or online. These can You can use these to enhance your in-person services or you can use them to provide all virtual services. And you can also kind of convert them to link together a hybrid because these are all virtual. These are really good bridge tools to be able to allow people to have access to the same shared resources, whether you're in person or online. So, and I'll just go over some of the most common ones that people have found most helpful here. Some of these you might already have used before, but in the video projects, so, you may have heard about the video production guide that I put together, but that video production guide takes a lot, it takes a lot of time planning. It's for people who want to, there are some options for beginners who just want to be able to go through a tutorial. And there are some that want to go through the whole full shebang of planning, storyboarding, blah, blah, blah. These video projects are just quick. They are so Flipgrid, you can use a video discussion board and ask people to record a little snippet and post it because sometimes people, sometimes you just communicate better when you're talking. It's more natural. It just, it, you process things better. You process things differently. 
So some people like to write it out, some people like to use a video. And so this one, you just record it, post it, someone records a video in response, and on and on and on. And then you can have this Flipgrid as a reference point to share out different ideas and resources. And you can also build like a little shared idea board in Flipgrid and say, this is the topic we're talking about. Um, what has been most interesting to you? What has impacted you most? What has, um, if you're doing like a parenting and technology course, you can say, what are the tools that have been horrible for your kids? Why? What are the kid? What are the online tools that have been awesome for your kids and why? What would you recommend? What would you not recommend? And just start gathering these different ideas and a shared board so that people know what other people are trying to, what has worked for other people. And Canva is also a really quick tool to make videos. Um, if you just record something using your webcam, pop it into Canva, you can add in little text and tools really quickly. And then there is a shareable link. So you can just, uh, I'll open up a video that I did. Hopefully I didn't export it already. Oh, I might have. What are you going to do? <laughs> but So when you do a, when you do this, there's always a share button up here. So this is stored on Canvas servers, and then you would just copy the link to share it out, and you can do that with videos too. So the same thing I did with this, with the PDF that I sent over, you can do with a video. So it's a lot quicker, it's easier, and if you just want a video that is living for a short period of time, that is a good way to do it. And I'm going to reopen my teaching tech. So I'm going to close some of these that I don't need anymore. And back here. And Adobe Spark is also a really quick one that you can add in like a little background music. You can add in text layers. You can trim your video, add transition slides. I personally use Canva way more than Adobe Spark just because it's personal preference but I know people who have used Adobe Spark, they're used to it, they like it, and it's all good. And Screencast-O-Matic is a newer one that I just found out about and I've been playing around with, but it's an easier yeah. tool to be able to record your screen, edit, and share. Mm -hmm. and I, I've, I've, used, I've used that, I think, for things. I've recommended it to people over the years, yeah. It's like it's online, it's free. Yeah. Oh, and all the tools on here, um, I made sure they have a free option or they just are always free. And so a lot of times when you bring in groups, they'll want to be able to share ideas and kind of map out progress and kind of start organizing thoughts and start prioritizing what they want to work on. So this brainstorm and ideation section is really good for that. Um, you can build a virtual post-its in Miro. You can do, you can build out flowcharts, diagrams, and just kind of start organizing things. You can start doing mind mapping. Um, if you are one of the ones that really likes to do mind mapping and diagrams using your UX stuff from the first section of this course, um, there are people that are starting to use these brainstorming tools just to lay out their mind maps and collaborative boards and collaborative problem boards and because there are sharing options so that multiple people can access that same tool and uh, Miro is the one that I use if you're wondering and if you are trying to make things look splashier um, Canva as Krista said is probably the most popular one it's awesome it's delightful I use it. Um, Vengage, I right? <laughs> yeah. And Vengage is kind of like the competitor to Canva. Um, they've kind of, they've started to kind of niche themselves out to be more business related, but they still do a lot of the same templates. So if you or if you don't find what you're looking for in Canva, or if you want to try out something new, Vengage is an option. 
and VisMe also does something really similar. And Google Docs and Google Slides has a variety of templates for all that same stuff. But personally, I think Canva and Vengage are easier to use. Um, you have to do a little bit more heavy lifting to be able to customize something in Google Docs or in Microsoft Word. But honestly, oh, not. I have a question. Someone did post, and I'll ask Connie to clarify a little bit. She wants to know: Is this on the free side or the purchase side? Uh, which product were you wondering about? Um, and and all these, they have all these have free options, and most of them had paid options too. So everything has something free, but there will be potentially something if you wanted to bump up what you're using and get more features. There's yeah. an option for um, there's the ability to pay and get some more features, but everything she's talking about has at least some sort of free version, yeah. correct? Yeah, and for the most part, the big uh, thing about the oh, was there a clarification? Just specifically wondering about Canva. What are the oh, yeah, Canva? Um, there is a pretty much most of the things that you want to use are in the free option. Mm -hmm. The main thing that you would want to upgrade Canva for if you were going to do it is it opens up a new set of template options. So it expands the different templates that you can use in different categories. It expands out the different images that are like the default free images that are available. I guess yeah. they can't be default free if you have to upgrade to pay for them, but they have some free images that are available. But if you don't want to pay for it, you can also upload your own. It just takes that extra step be able to be able to grab it in there. Um, basically, yeah, that's the thing with Canva. Yeah, you can get into it for free. I have my own account, and you'll see that there's because there's templates for putting frames around things or having backgrounds or whatever, and you'll see that some of them have just some sort of little notice on them and it you can see the ones that say you need to upgrade to a pro account to get these particular ones but there's a bunch of them already in there so if the ones that are for me so far the ones in there have been all i needed <laughs> but yeah oh and it the paid version supports png so if you need something that has a transparent background like a logo or something you're going to post on the web then you mm -hmm. would need to upgrade for that transparency or do the extra step to save it pull it into either a GIMP or an image manipulator and Imaging. pull out that transparent background. So it's really up to you. If you need to get into that kind of level of graphic design. <laughs> and I've used it for like logos and stuff. So that's the only reason I was looking at it. So that was pretty much it. And oh. these are just fun. Um, they're word cloud generators. They're pretty awesome. And so you can open up one of these, load in a list of terms, and it will automatically format it for you. And you can That's choose awesome. your colors, choose your shape, and pretty much do everything you want to. Um, I will point out this one from Monkey Learn because you can copy and paste a so if you wrote a paper, if you wrote a document, if you wrote um, a creative writing piece or a poem, you can copy and paste your text in here and generate the cloud, and it will pull out the words that you use most frequently. And it will also start pulling in synonyms, and it uses like a machine learning process to be able to sift through those and kind of pull it out and categorize it. So if you started doing, where is this? So this is the text that I use to generate this course. So if I copy, I just grabbed a little bit of it, copy it, paste it, generate a cloud. So then it will automatically generate the words that I use most often. So this actually helped me realize that I use certain words, like I overuse certain words. Um, I actually recently went through the document and I changed the number of times I said ultimately. Because <laughs> I said like the ultimate goal or ultimately, or I said that so dang many times and this generator showed me that. 
but mm -hmm. then these will also show you kind of what you think is important and what could be important like within the course yeah, because... take out those kind of adjective type things and see that you know the main words is what really is the important your 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 way of speaking isn't what these things should be reflecting right <laughs> you know and it also sure I say awesome too much I'm, i i know that i've seen that come up a lot <laughs> and i know that's not what really needs to be showing here <laughs> I haven't said ultimately in a month. <laughs> you know? <Now>. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Sorry. I think I left a few in there, but there's probably still quite a few in there. But it didn't show up in my top five, so I'll take it. <laughs> Apparently, I said people 71 times. Who knew? Mm -hmm. All right, but back in here, let me go and make sure I cover everything that, I'd mainly just wanna point out the stuff that you might wanna start paying attention to as you start digging through this. And I will also point out, so these methods of instruction, if you remember, I said that there were patterns that people were starting to follow for which of these different types of instruction people use when people start passing through the skills progression. So I put that in here. Um, so stage one, when people have, and I'm going to make this bold just to make it pop out a little more, but this is a list of the stuff that people found most helpful when they're in that beginning stage. And then when they shifted over into that upper level, then they wanted more customized resources and they wanted to tackle specific stuff. So reader advisors and reference librarians, they got to work out when they started getting more specific and one-on-one -on -one training for specific goals, like goals related things. If you have a group of small business owners or a group of like a small interest group that is working toward a shared problem, then they would be working toward this, comp this conscious incompetence where they know what they need, but they're still working on it. And maker spaces have been like the ideal exploration space, but the generic maker space, when you first learn that the stuff exists, would be in that first stage. You don't know why it matters, but you might want to tinker around and try it once. Then you find out what you actually need and you start wanting to get customized maker activities. This is where things start to fall apart a lot of times because it takes more work to be for the library staff to be able to understand and customize those maker activities for people to progress through toward competence. So just kind of understanding and mapping out the stages, like the steps that people would need to be able to learn to learn that technology tool, learn that resource, learn that sewing kit, learn that circuitry board. And this is where you start losing your STEM people is because they can't find the resources or assistance to be able to progress through toward conscious competence. And they haven't been able to get the resources to customize the thing that they found out they like to their life. And because that takes a different skill set, that takes a different skill set for the learner and for the library staff to be able to say, okay, I know you need it, I know I really, really, really want to help you move through this process and be able to customize this, but I have very little time because this isn't my wheelhouse and I haven't looked at the different people in my community that are able to, or there aren't other people in my community that are able to use this tool. And then it fizzles. But so when people start shifting over into this conscious competence and they're able to just do it in their sleep this is where they want to be able to get inspiration they still need access to the technology tools and they need access to the databases and resources so that they can go through their same skills progression and they want to be able to have an ins like an inspiration board or be able to know that other people in the community might not be working on the exact same problem but they have the same mindset they want to try anything, know anything, do anything. And a lot of people, depending on what they have at home, they might still need internet access and they wanna be able to share ideas, meet with people and do the things. So this is kind of like how it's been shifting over. 
So when you understand where people are in this process, you can start connecting them with the right thing that they need. And then you can start customizing the tools and activities for to build an engaging process so that people aren't bored out of the mind out of their minds trying to do stuff. So you can use that cust the online teaching tool list. And there's also these resources from San Diego, which has been awesome. Apparently I'm getting a redirect. Fine. But these are just pretty much every method under the sun that you would want to use as an activity option. So this is what it would look like. If you remember, I don't know if anyone attended the How to Make Digital Literacy Less Boring. These activities in here are basically more of what was featured in here. So these are the actual activities that you would do with people. And so we are at a little after 11, yeah. So it's about 11.04. If there are no more questions, I will probably leave it at that. And you can peruse through the content and figure out what you need most. Mm -hmm. yeah. If anybody does have any desperate last minute questions you want to ask of Amanda while she's here, go ahead and get it into the chat or into the questions section and we'll grab it. Um, and I will also post a link to the slides. Yes. Which also has my contact stuff. Yep. You can always reach out to her afterwards. <laughs> sure. And anyone can view, copy link. And if you don't grab the link now, that's okay. As I said, um, it will be included in the recording um, on the page when I put the recording up, and I'll show you that in a second here where that will be. Cool. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. But other than that, mm -hmm. that is the long and the short of it. <laughs> All right. Let me see if anybody has any questions or typing. I can't see if you guys are typing, so I don't know if some, you're in the midst of something, so I always give a minute or two. Um, I will say, um, as I said, we've been recording today. Uh, the show as we do every week, and it will be available um, by the end of the day tomorrow, the latest. It depends on how GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. Um, everyone who attended this morning and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know that the recording is um, ready for you to watch. And I'm going to pull back presenter control to my screen now. Take it away. There we go. Um, and here, there we go. So this is the session page where you may have logged in or um, registered um, with a link to the course, the Teacher Technology course. You've got that. Um, what is this that I opened up? Oh, the link that you're given to the Canva there for reference. Um, the other sessions in the Teaching Technology in the Library series, session one, um, as I said, it was two weeks, so it was recorded. If you click on that link, it will bring you to the page with the link to the recording and the slides. So you'll have the same thing for today's show. And you'll see on every one of these session pages, we have links to the other ones. So right now, if you wanted to, if you click on session three or four coming up, it will bring you to the page for the upcoming shows where you can register for them, register for them if you haven't yet. And then for marketing and follow-up, the last one. So definitely get in there, reg register for the upcoming shows. Um, I'm going to pop back to our Encompass Live main page. These are our up other upcoming shows. We have all of our shows coming. Um, I'll just show you our archives are right here on the underneath all of the upcoming shows. And most recent ones are always at the top of the list. So today's will be up here. And you can click on it and you'll get access to the recording and the slides. Um, here I'll show you that you can search our archives if you want to to look up see if there's any other shows of any on any topics you are interested in. Um, you can search our full archives or just the most recent 12 months, um, and that is because this is the full show archives for Encompass Live. I'm going to scroll down a little bit here. I'm not going to scroll all the way down because that's a lot. Um, we have our full show archives here in this long, long list. Um, Encompass Live premiered in January 2009, so we have over 10 years worth 
and it would have been 12 years worth of recordings here. Um, so just be aware if you do a search on here and you do watch a recording, be aware of the original broadcast date. All of them have the date on when they first um, happened. So you'll know if something is still current, if it's out of date. Um, some of the sessions will stay on the test of time, reading lists and general things, but some things, um, information may have changed. Services and products may have changed drastically since we had a show. Some things might not exist anymore. Uh, links might be broken, websites might no longer exist. So um, just pay attention as you are watching any of our archives of any of those situations. Um, we do have a Facebook page, which I got linked everywhere. If you do like to use Facebook, you can give us a like over there. We send reminders about shows and when the recordings are available. So here's a reminder for today's show. People could log in on the fly. Um, information about our speakers. Oh, we have a new state poet, youth poet laureate in Nebraska. Uh, we did a show about that earlier. That's why she, it's been shared on the page. And then when the recordings are available. So if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We also do have a um, hashtag and comp live that we use in other social media, Twitter and Instagram. So if you want to, um, you can look for that hashtag elsewhere to keep up on what we're doing as well. Um, Amanda will be back as I, as we said, with parts three and four of the Teaching Technology in the Library series, part three on July 14th, Finding Partners and Preparing Staff, part four on July 28th, Marketing and Follow-up. Um, but she'll also be back for a regular monthly and or Pretty Sweet Tech on June 30th, so before those, talk about 3D meeting space for librarians, spatial. Um, with uh, Chad Marin, Marin, who is from um, St. Petersburg College in Florida, and he's going to be talking to her about that. Sounds interesting. Um, but unfortunately, before that, uh, we've a, oh, sorry, you want to say something, Amanda? Spatial is pretty awesome. That's pretty slick. Yes, I'm interested, very much interested in that one. Um, but next week's show, not so fun, bed bugs in the library. Ah, yes, it happens. Um, our Lincoln City Library here in Nebraska has dealt with this over the years and has a great way of having to, to learn about this and deal with it. Um, so uh, along with staff from our uh, county extension office. So join us next week if you want to find out how to deal with potential bed bugs in your library um, and um, any of our other shows we have. So does it look like anybody had any desperate questions? That's fine. Thank you everyone for being here with us. Thank you again for being here, Amanda. We'll see you in two weeks for your pretty sweet deck. Um, uh, um, I yes. did have a quick question for you. Uh -huh. It wasn't about this. Okay, well, hang on a sec. So we'll see you then. And that will wrap it up for today's show. Was there anything that you wanted on the recording for people or? No, you can stop yeah. the recording. Okay. That's cool. All right. So thank you, everybody. And we'll see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye.